Okay, so now I'll switch to English. So if I'm not wrong, and Gabriella, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that this is the first time that Otto Centismi showcases research from um, a university based in Belgium. All the more reason then to give us, uh, to give uh, the warmest welcome to uh, Bart van den Bosse and Carlo Leo from the brilliant university KU Leuven, the largest university in Belgium and in the Low Countries. Uh, where I had the, the, the was so lucky to work in the last uh, two years before traveling back to the UK and going back to Durham and to call them my colleagues and my friends. Bart is full professor of Italian literature there, and Carlo is work, is finishing a PhD in Italian studies at K11 under uh, Bart's guidance, and both are working at the brilliant project Remembering the City of Life. Um, uh, that is dedicated to the representation of um, the uh, Impresa di Fiume, the Annuncios Impresa di Fiume uh, in 1919. And I believe that today's talk is inspired by this project. Um, Bart, Carlo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, we will start by sharing our screen, of course. Um, okay. Uh, like this okay okay now it works okay okay good well um, um thank you all for uh, for being here for attending uh this uh, this seminar and our presentation on on fiume on the ottocentismi in uh, d'annuncio's fiume uh let's start with uh an outline of our presentation. The first part uh, of our talk will be devoted to the a topos, what you could call a topos in uh, scholarly work on uh, the Impresa di Fiume, the idea that Fiume was a kind of political laboratory of the 20th century. Um, so we will deal 10, 15 minutes with this, with this, um, this topic because it's, it's quite important. Uh, and it will also um, um, allow us also to highlight to what extent actually there is a lot of autocento in the Fiume that has been to some extent also somewhat overlooked or somewhat uh, taken for granted by, uh, by many scholars. Um, the second part of the talk will actually look into uh, the memoria dell'Ottocento in the in D'Annunzio's Fiume from three perspectives, uh, the broader uh, frame of the irredentismo, which is always uh, present to, to some extent, uh, the specific use of a couple of what we have called Garibaldian scripts, uh, and then the second, uh, the third part, sorry, is uh, the kind of uh, pathos about spirituality, spiritual experiences, etc., that actually can be uh, connected uh, to some extent to, to Mazzini. Uh, then the third and final part of the presentation will be uh, dedicated to the way this memory, or in the plural, memories of the Ottocento, and more specifically of the Risorgimento, is actually reframed. Uh, re-elaborated and also if you want manipulated and, uh, and profoundly drastically changed also um, in the Impresa di Fiume. Okay, but let's start with um, the first topic, uh, Fiume as a political laboratory of the 20th century. It is actually, like I said, it's a kind of topos and we will illustrate it with a couple of um, examples also. Uh, and um, in comparison to this idea of the political laboratory, actually the uh, autocento in Fiume is definitely understudied. Okay, Carlo. Okay. So for a start, what was Fiume again? On September 12, 1919, the man who defiantly out Byron, Byron uh, as reported in an article from the New York Times, marched from Ronchi, Trieste, to Fiume with a detachment of grenadiers and arditi, provided, of course, with machine guns and arm, uh, armored uh, vehicles, in violation of orders from uh, uh, the Italian government. The event became famous as La Santa Entrata, reminiscent of La Santa Intrada of 1409, when Venetian representatives entered the city of Zadar. Stop playing. 
Oops. Wow. Okay, we'll skip the video. Otherwise, okay. Here you can see the uh, New York uh, Times article I was addressing before. D'Annunzio, hair of David, poet warrior, uh, a sort of Prometheus who defied uh, Jove by, uh, for mankind's sake. Indeed, a selection of books you can see here detailing La Santa Entrata, contributing to an ideal fiume canon of literary accounts on the occupation. One can die of, with joy after experiencing an hour like the one of La Santa Entrata, uh, in the words of Gabriele D'Annunzio. Okay, now, uh, of course, the Marcia di Ronchi is the start for, uh, of an occupation, occupation that eventually will last almost 60 months. Uh, so it actually means that Fiume, uh, as an occupied uh, city, becomes something of an entity that um, is organized also politically uh, with a number of political institutions uh, and so on and so forth. But the 16 months of this occupation are also marked by uh, profound um, contrasts, tensions between different groups, uh, different factions. Um, broadly speaking and very schematically speaking, and you can see uh, in, the, in the right uh, upper right corner um, the quotes. Um, different scholars have um, distinguished between two groups, like the, the legalitari and the ribelli, the ragionevoli, the scalmanati. One could also say the more conservative factions who just wanted annexation of Fiume to Italy, and the more, if you want, revolutionary factions, uh, which is not an entirely mm, accurate right. term, but anyway, the more revolutionary factions who actually wanted to transform Fiume in something of, you could call, a political laboratory. That is, broadly speaking, um, the division we see, and it's important also to stress that um, when the occupation goes into the fourth, fifth month, at the beginning of 1920, uh, we see actually that many conservatives leave uh, Fiume uh, and have become a kind of minority in the town, at least for the time being then. And that it is actually in 1920 that Fiume really develops into something that we could call, to some extent, a politically, political laboratory. And uh, Carlo will um, give us a couple of examples. Yeah, indeed. Uh, once the ambitions of rapid annexation to Italy were frustrated, actually, the Comandante established an agenda of, let's say, political and social experiments and framed the Fiume Constitution, La Carta del Carnaro. A League of Fiume was also theorized with the aim to promote unity among the oppressed people of the world. Uh, with the unanimous consent of all peoples deceived or conquered, trampled upon by the tyranny and injustice of the conference, the League of Fiume has been formed. It brandishes the sword of revolution, of revolt, against the pseudo League of Nation, conspiracy of bandits and international thieves. Gabriele D'Annunzio is the head of the League of Fiume. Okay, and um, it is actually this, um, this, uh... Well, we, we've made we've given two examples. There are many more yeah. that actually these these examples that um, have brought several scholars to call uh, Fiume a microcosm of modern world of 20th century uh, Europe of 20th century politics, if you want. And and why is that? Uh, there are a couple of things that have been associated uh, with Fiume, identified also in uh, the occupation of Fiume. The first idea is that of a new style of doing politics uh, and a way of doing politics uh, adapted to the 20th century, mainly high, uh, highly mediatized, uh, extensive use of rhetoric, um, choreography, rituals, symbols, and so on and so forth. Of course, this was also uh, already uh, definitely uh, present in the second half of the 19th century, but few may seen as a kind of a showcase uh, of what, to what extent you could actually use these characteristics. Fiume has also been uh, seen as the place where um, a more 19th century style patriotism uh, has been transformed into a very radical uh, nationalism, 
all our nationalism uh, linked to, if you want, the 19th century model of the nation state has become pre-fascism, proto-fascism, giving way to a to totalitarian idea of uh, the state. Also, uh, even more, anarcho-individualism in Fiume is present, indeed. It is part of, uh, especially in 1920, part of, 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 uh, of, of the Fiume occupation. It has been seen as foreshadowing um, uh, Woodstock or uh, Il Sessantotto, uh, for instance, by Claudia Salaris in uh, book Alla Festa della Revoluzione. It's a bit overstating the argument, I think, but anyway, that's a different topic. Uh, and Michael Ledeen has called Fiume a microcosm of the madness and the magic of the 20th century. Following on what Bart said, uh, Mosse suggests that D'Annunzio was instrumental in spearheading the profound transformation in the relation between poetry and politics that characterized the 20th century indeed. In summary, the poet contributed something new, essential and original to the art of governing. Myth creation that mobilized the masses, a call to action. As a result of these developments, uh, says Mosse, we can observe the growth of a new political style which operated within the framework of myth, symbols and public festivals. The rise of modern nationalism was, accompa was accompanied by the growth of the secular religion of the nation. And it was here that the poets could find a meaningful place. D'Annunzio actually furthered the new political style. Again, following on what Bart said before, uh, the occupation of Fiume has also been perceived as the beginning of the age of mass politics in the 20th century. Pankaj Mishra, a columnist for the New York Times, believes D'Annunzio to be uh, the forefather of movements of uh, radical nationalism, such as uh, MAGA or Make America Great Again, or alt-right extremism, which are, uh, Mishra argues, expressions of existential rebellion carried out by groups of misfits. Frustrated men have defined whole new modes of politics. Again, uh, among historians, another popular element of Fiume's modernity is its perceived proximity uh, to fascist culture. Uh, Ledin writes, D'Annunzio has been described as the John the Baptist of Italian fascism. Virtually the entire ritual of fascism comes from the Free State of Fiume, the Balcony Address, the Roman Salute, Eia Eia La La, the dialogues with the crowd, the use of religious symbols in a new secular setting, but also the eulogies to the martyrs of the coast. Yeah, also the anarcho-individualistic component is crucial uh, in literary accounts of the occupation. One can argue that uh, the recent popularity of Fiume in socio-political studies is linked uh, with its perception as a futurist colony. Uh, where creative pra practitioners uh, interacted in the seclusion of a, of a, of a sealed off state and could, exper could experiment uh, uh, artistically and politically. And although futurists represented only a small fraction of D'Annunzio's legionnaires, Claudia Salaris sees D'Annunzio's capture city as a place of artistic exception where a uh, rivoluzione lirica would mark the coming about of an aesthetic state, anticipating indeed the tensions of the late 60s. Uh, art, uh, politics and free love, uh, the real 68 was in Fiume, was a title, uh, a headline of Il Giornale, national newspaper. Ah yeah, what follows, I hope you can see that, is a scene from the recently released movie, The Bad Poet, Il Cattivo Poeta, uh, which documents the final years of Gabriele D'Annunzio. And here we can see his former lover, uh, Luisa Baccara. Uh, she reminisces over the events of Fiume. Senza sparare un solo colpo abbiamo preso la città. Credo sia stata l'unica città al mondo governata da un poeta. 
Fiume. I 500 giorni più belli della nostra vita. Era una festa continua. Non esistevano divieti, gerarchie. Si poteva fare tutto. Camminare nudi per strada. Prendere quintali di cocaina. Potevi divorziare. Pensi votavano persino le donne. Abbiamo anche scritto una Costituzione. Eravamo pazzi, ma ci siamo divertiti. Okay, now, uh, these are a couple of examples of um, uh, scholars who have highlighted, um, rightly also highlighted, the connections between the Impresa di Fiume and a couple of uh, political uh, ideology systems developments in the 20th century. But what about the Ottocento? Uh, uh, there is uh, a lot of memoria of the Ottocento in Fiume. Uh, everybody knows it, but it, is a bit, it has been a bit taken for granted, we think. Uh, and we would... Um, um want to highlight three perspectives like i just said um uh, but for a start let's um point out two um scholars who have done some work uh, on the ottocento in fiume there's an, uh, an article by the german historian gumbrecht on uh, the idea of redemption uh, in fiume in discourses on fiume also and then a recent book uh, by federico carlo simonelli uh who has highlighted uh the important uh, role of rituals, slogans, and so on and so forth in Fiume and their direct, explicit connections uh, to uh, rituals of the Risorgimento. Okay. So the Nuncio had been, of course, one of the most ardent advocates of Italian claims to territory on the eastern shore of the Adriatic. Uh, a leader, let's say, of a vocal minority of nationalists who lamented insufficient territorial gains, compensations for the national effort of the war. It was a bloodbath that costed 600,000 uh, lives uh, for the Italian part. So this was expressed in the popular notion of uh, Vittoria Mutilata. Irredentism as a cultural phenomenon fueled uh, many, uh, the rhetoric of many of the high profile intellectuals uh, involved in the war effort. And actually it worked as a, an ideological basis for Danunzio's expedition. Indeed, resentment at the new world order forging Paris over 1919-1920 was not confined uh, to the defeated powers. On the contrary, it was also censored by those who believed they had won the war but lost the peace. Uh, part of the Italian community felt that the promises made by the Entente when they were negotiating were, not, uh, were no longer taken uh, seriously. The, uh, the offer was made at a time where uh, there was no thought of independent Yugoslavia and no talk of uh, national self-determination. You can see here uh, a satirical depiction of, the 14th, uh, of, of Wilson's 14 points. Uh, moreover, Italy's vulnerability along its eastern flank had been eliminated by the collapse of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, the mounting unsatisfaction with the outcome of the peace conference gave way to an escalation of violence. Uh, not dissimilar from other cases uh, uh, in, in other parts of Europe, let's say a war after the war in a climate of social rising tension, of rising social tension. Uh, I'll skip this one, okay. Uh, Nel 1919, Fiume fu il this is by the historian e per certi versi è veramente paradossale. L'Italia aveva vinto la Grande Guerra, aveva battuto il suo avversario storico, aveva la possibilità per la prima e ultima volta nella sua storia di diventare una grande potenza egemonica nell'area dell'Adriatico e del Danubio, ma la perse. La perse per una serie di 
germi di malattie, di psicosi, di ossessioni che si concentrarono tutti in questa piccola città portuale che gli italiani non avevano mai sentito nominare prima della fine del primo conflitto mondiale, Fiume. Ok. So, the city of Fiume quickly emerged as the emblem of Italy's national humiliation and, of course, longing for redemption. What made the post-war uh, disappointment so tangible was the sudden upsurge of images of bodily mutilation and rebirth, which had become a concrete reality for around uh, a million war veterans. No one tapped into such collecting feelings with more inventiveness than Gabriele D'Annunzio. This is from Lettera ai Dalmati, 1919. Io e i miei compagni non vorremmo più essere italiani in una Italia rammollita dai fomenti transatlantici del dottor Wilson e amputata, amputated, dalla chirurgia transalpina del dottor Clemenceau. La guerra non è finita, ma è nel suo colmo. In D'Annunzio's in D'Annunzio's rhetoric, Fiume is yet another battle of uh, la Grande Guerra, seen as a quarta guerra d'indipendenza, meant to bring the risorgimento to completion. Indeed, according to Emilio Gentile, the myth of the risorgimento as being an incomplete national revolution stemmed from Mazzinian radicalism, which later animated the Great War and of course, and of course fascism. D'Annunzio too described the human uh, legionnaires with the formula, i redentori della vittoria. And it was during the occupation that the uh, resurgimental concept of national redemption was adapted to the new political era, uh, meaning the conditions of the early uh, 1920s. Of course, redemption myths presuppose an ideal past and a deficient present. In between, there lies an event that explains the interruption of the ideal starting condition. In Christian culture, of course, the space is occupied by sin, which has to be redeemed by sacrificial offerings or acts of uh, self-purification. Fiume, in the words of D'Annunzio, is the Holocaust city, la città holocausta, consumed by fire. Moreover, the time that elapses between the cultural recognition of a portion of territory as an unredeemed land and its eventual uh, redemption, that period is referred to as a biblical passion, la passione di fiume. Okay, well, in short, in short to sum this up, uh, the, uh, the idea of redemption, uh, of irredentismo, redemption, uh, Fiume, like a terra redenta by D'Annunzio, is the first uh, major uh, connection between the impresa and uh, the, the memoria dell'Ottocento. Uh, it is actually uh, a broader narrative frame, uh, a master narrative that is constantly present in the background, but also foregrounded um, quite frequently in D'Annunzio's speeches, uh, writings, public performances, and rituals as well. So there are, for instance, references to Guglielmo Overdam. Uh, of course, lots of reference to Garibaldi, also more direct connections to uh, other episodes in the Risorgimento of Terre Redente, of uh, territories that have been uh, uh, freed, uh, occupied, annexed uh, to uh, Italy. For instance, it's not a coincidence that the official inauguration of D'Annunzio as a Comandante um, is organized on September 20, 1919, which is actually the anniversary of Portapia. And there, is, there are direct uh, explicit references uh, to this uh, as well. Um, there are also in Fiume uh, are rituals uh, to commemorate the war victims, where again, the connections to rituals of the Risorgimento uh, are explicit and are uh, all over the place. It's also interesting to point out that uh, Fiume, um, when Danunzio arrives in Fiume, Fiume is actually uh, a town where in 1919, uh, all the, well, not all the streets, but the, the, the most important streets um, have all changed uh, to, uh, changed names. They have, they have all switched to uh, Italian names, but more specifically, 
uh, names connected to the Risorgimento, uh, Via Battisti, Via Verdi, Via Carducci, and, also, and so on and so forth. And also the Via Trenta Ottobre, um, uh, with reference to the 30th of October, 1918, when the Consiglio Nazionale di Fiume um, um, voted for the annexation uh, of Fiume to, to Italy. Uh, so actually, uh, D'Annunzio arriving in Fiume uh, arrives in a town that actually has expressed, uh, explicitly expressed its um, um, intention to become part of Italy, also in the, the names of the streets. Okay, and this is the first page of uh, the Bolletino Ufficiale, where you see uh, that Fiume celebra il Natale della Terza Roma, uh, September 20th, uh, the connection to uh, Porta Pia. Also, by means of example, uh, one can read D'Annunzio's first public address to the people of Fiume and appreciate the constant references to key figures of the Risorgimento and Italian irredentism. D'Annunzio recalls the events that led to his departure for, for, for Fiume from Ronchi, of course. Uh, feverish, he's haunted by the ghost of uh, Guglielmo Oberda, who is considered, of course, to be the, one of the first uh, Italian martyrs. Uh, in, his, in, in D'Annunzio's ears, also the demanding voices of the fallen soldiers compelling him to move forward. In an intricate interplay, of images from the Risorgimento, distant past, and of course, the recent experience of war. Okay, now, um, second important element uh, connecting uh, Fiume to the Risorgimento um, consists in what we have called a, a Garibaldian script or in the plural scripts. Uh, there are constant references uh, to Garibaldi uh, already before the actual start of the occupation. You, you can see in the, in the um, uh, D'Annunzio's speech in May 1919, there are uh, references to Garibaldi. Uh, already uh, there's talk about a kind of spedizione and um, something, uh, performance and action uh, imitating Garibaldi. And then there are constant, of course, quotes that play with uh, references to Garibaldi, disobedisco, uh, uh, as opposed to the obedisco of 1866. Uh, Fiume o morte, Italia o morte, uh, uh, reference, of course, to the Roma o morte of the 1862, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's actually really all over the place. It's always present. There are constant, um, uh, constant references to Garibaldi as a way of activating also in the, the audience uh, yeah, at large. Uh, uh, the references to, to Garibaldi are constant references to the March, uh, uh, March, uh, Marcia di Ronchi, of course, but also then uh, once Fiume is occupied, the idea of a Marcia su Roma, uh, the idea that uh, they have to continue with what they are doing uh, and uh, march towards Rome. Of course, again, a uh, reference to a Garibaldian script, if you want. Also very important, the cult of the military volunteers. Uh, it's also really very much uh, part of this Memoria Garibaldina that is really very, very present in, in Fiume. Um, and then also the reference to the Duce, of course. Uh, yeah, will, uh, yeah. On, this. on this topic, uh, Garibaldi is uh, in resurgimental rhetoric, the Duce par excellence. Uh, you can see here, Carducci's In Morte di Giovanni Cairoli, where Garibaldi stands out against the Roman son, the glorious Duce. The official bulletins of the Italian Fiume Command a document with a wealth of examples, the public ceremonies and events of Danunzio's uh, political strategies. And here there are hundreds of, uh, of occurrences of Duce when indeed addressing Danunzio. Finally, you can see uh, below the entry Duce in the Encyclopedia Italiana of 1932. After marching on Rome, Mussolini became known as Duce, creator and leader of the fascist revolution. In this sense, the word has entered all languages. Ah, yeah. Um, also regarding uh, women's participation in the occupation of Fiume, uh, scholarship has indeed acknowledged that the stories of hundreds of, uh, of female legionaries have been uh, passed over in silence. Uh, they were champions of irredentism, they performed active service in conflict zones and testified to their patriotic fate, assisting occupying troops. 
Red Cross nurse, nurses, uh, canteen keepers. They were employed in several military departments. Some even claim to have taken up arms. They are a part of a constellation of women's organization dedicated to the assistance of soldiers after the war. A breeding ground for projects aimed at promoting Italianita, Italianism, in the Aradim uh, lands. What, in, what needs to be stressed though, is that despite what some, let's call them partial breedings of the female condition in Fiume may, may lead to believe, the role of women often follows a traditional uh, resurgimental script, as attested by the uh, memoirs of uh, uh, Margherita Incisa di Camerana, for example, or Maria Vitali. They were part of the female component of the legionari. Okay, then uh, the third element we wanted to highlight is uh, what we have called the Mazzinian pathos. It's the if you want a more vague, um, uh, more vague set of, of references, uh, very important and very um, uh, very present is this, uh, this stress on the spiritual dimension of the Fiume experience. Uh, Fiume uh, D'Annunzio regularly or constantly stresses the fact that Fiume is not just about territory, uh, but it's really about uh, spiritual renewal. It has to be. It's supposed to be a spiritual uh, experience. Uh, with a number of topoi that can that we can see are loosely connected to uh, to Mazzini, uh, you the energy, the idea of rebirth, regeneration, uh, change that can also be radical. Everything has to become new, etc. Also, the international orientation. Uh, Carlo mentioned before the Lega di Fiume, this uh, this anti League of Nations, a League of the oppressed people all over the world. Uh, also in an already an anti-colonial uh, context. Uh, this can also be connected, of course, to international orientation in the Risorgimento that is connected to Mazzini, but not only to Mazzini, Mazzini I would say. But definitely there is um, uh, in discourse uh, by the Nunzio, but also by others uh, during the Fiume occupation, there is this tendency to, if you want, activate uh, marginalized, more radical voices uh, of the Risorgimento, especially because they are uh, useful to be um, usually played out against the logica del palazzo, huh? uh, and of course, then the idea is uh, that, uh, that this is kind of the paradigm of Cavour, if you want. Huh? Uh, the diplomats uh, trying to make deal to strike a deal somewhere in a palace, etc., is constantly opposed to uh, a more radical um, um, uh, take on things. Uh, also, connection here um, with the La Giovine Fiume, uh, the uh, Irredentist Association in Fiume, founded also only in 1905, this, so quite late, if you want. Um, all this, of course, uh, leads also to tensions with the more conservative factions in Fiume, to the extent that actually they see that they see a danger of uh, a deriva republicana. Huh? Uh, and so there are a lot of monarchists, of course, in Fiume also. They just want to have Fiume being, becoming part of Italy, and then they end up with D'Annunzio and a couple of these uh, very enthusiastic youngsters who actually are thinking of, about the Regenza del Carnaro, new constitution, etc. So it's one of one source of tension, of course, also in, in Fiume. But of course, and this will bring us to uh, the third part of our talk, uh, it is a Mazzinian pathos in Salsa D'Annunziana, with of course, uh, combined with a number of references to Nietzsche, or if you want, uh, pseudo-references so, yeah. as a yeah. kind of uh, highly personal interpretation of Nietzsche, of course. The idea of the poet as a Superman, of course, being able to, uh, to lift uh, the entire population of human, the entire community to a higher level of, of consciousness, of spiritual experience, etc. Uh, stuff like that, of course, uh, and also in Salsa Pseudo Francescana with the stress, for instance, on Franciscan uh, values like poverty, simplicity, let's leave the world, let's leave uh, this uh, society that is addicted to material well-being, the plutocratia is also a term that has been used, let's leave it behind, uh, let's leave the simple life of the poor, uh, which, of course, in the mouth of D'Annunzio <laughs> sounds a bit strange to, to say the least. But anyway, it's really very much also present of this, this, this pathos, if you want. 
Uh, okay, you have Carlo. You have yeah, a yeah. Of examples. Venus also talks of chastity. Uh, I mean, it's not really the case. Uh, you know, uh, knowing the nouns here. Yeah. So I have a few examples. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. So uh, the Fiume archives at uh, Il Vittoriale degli Italiani, there is the Cyrodiil uh, built by Tannunzio, uh, a book of living stones and his uh, intentions. So the archives have uh, a copy of Paolo Buzzi's Carmi degli Augusti e dei Consolari. It was published in late 1919, in which the young poet lists the Fiume experience among an ideal collection of events from the Risorgimento canon. Just a few verses uh, from uh, his Laude di Gabriele D'Annunzio. As you can see here, uh, he mentions Garibaldi, Bellini, D'Annunzio. Tutto il Tirreno di Garibaldi, il Ionio di Bellini e l'Adriatico tuo, D'Annunzio. He concludes with the famous D'Annunzio, salute a noi, eia alala. And on the right, you can also uh, see the table of contents. Uh, you can see here how D'Annunzio actually features among Mazzini, Cavour, Carlo Alberto, Vittorio Emanuele, a sort of community by the sense of, I would say, noble spirits. Oh ah, yeah. Uh, one can also draw some uh, parallels between D'Annunzio's concern for a natural community bonded by blood in Fiume and the idea of a national community during the Risorgimento. On this matter, uh, the interesting book by Eduardo uh, Marcello Barsotti uh, that was presented in a previous meeting of Ottocentismi. Okay, now let's move on to the third and final parts uh, of our talk. Uh, the uses of the Memoria dell'Ottocento in, um, in Fiume. Um, for a start, one could say it's of course, well, one has to say, of course, it's a political use of the memory of the Risorgimento. That is obviously uh, quite clear. Um, references to the Risorgimento are instrumental in legitimizing the occupation. Uh, by rituals, by symbols, by the oath also, etc. And of course, also to justify what is actually deserved in the sense that many of the volunteers of the Legionari actually deserted the Italian army and risk uh, heavy penalties also threatened by the Italian government um, for this. So um, reference to the Risorgimento also serve uh, in this respect to uh, tranquilize, if you want, yeah. the, the Legionari. Uh, and then, of course, like I said, uh, the broader frame of the Irredentismo as the, the narrative frame uh, within which Fiume is then an episode uh, in a longer uh, story of uh, longer perspective, long, long durée perspective of Irredentismo. Um, um, and then also a connection uh, of Fiume to the Great War. Uh, Fiume is seen as then yet another battle uh, in the Great War, which actually uh, uh, did not end in 1918 from that point of view. Uh, um, so it's definitely a political instrumental use of the Risorgimento, but maybe it's also something more, especially if you want from, uh, from a cultural literary uh, perspective, uh, one could also highlight a number of other uh, characteristics of the use of the Memoria dell'Ottocento. Um, the first, uh, Feature, if you want, of this use of the Risorgimento, we could call historical overdetermination. Uh, it's not the best term we could come up with, anyway. Okay, um, meaning that D'Annunzio does not just quote the Risorgimento, but he quotes and uses all kinds of historical references, combining them uh, uh, in all sorts of ways. Of course, there are references to Rome, uh, to the Latinita, there are references to Venice. Uh, quite instrumental, of course, uh, in terms of the Adriatic Sea and, um, and uh, the claims of Italy to a part of the Adriatic Sea. A reference to the Eta Comunale, to the Renaissance, the Risorgimento then is one of the per um, periods and Great War. Um, the number of references is uh, so high, uh, the ways they are com uh, combined 
uh, are so different that one could actually say there is kind of overdetermination of history and geography, a kind of thickness, if you want, thinking of Clifford Geert's uh, idea of thick description. You see D'Annunzio creating a very thick space, if you want, and a very thick idea of history, um, which actually brings us to a situation where um, what we have is more than just the sum of the single references. Actually, we enter into a different, if you want, a different way of reading uh, time and space, of uh, moving through time and space. And D'Annunzio is then, I mean, the one who performs this kind of mastery uh, of uh, history. So history is something um, not just you can play with, you could say, uh, you can uh, freely combine, uh, wander around, but you can create all sorts of uh, combinations between historical references entering into, entering into a different um, a connection to history, which you could connect a little bit to Nietzsche again, or Danun's interpretation of Nietzsche, and the idea that uh, we should at some point um, break up the past and turn history into new stories. And that yeah. is a bit what, what we can see actually in Danunzio. That's a bit the way Danunzio uses the Risorgimento uh, to, um, to move uh, beyond, if you want, a, a linear theologi teleological perspective on history and move to a different kind of um, um, way of, 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 of uh, history, but also geography, uh, I would say. So there's to some respect, if you want to, we move a bit away from the typical 19th century space time of the nation state. And we move to something that is different. It's not very clear what it is. Uh, that is a, that's, that's a different, um, a different matter, of course. But definitely, you see that uh, the manipulation of history uh, brings us uh, into uh, something that is a bit uncharted territory, if you want. Um, the second... Um, um, point I would like to make is that the, within the context of the, well, uh, the 20th century, uh, the end of the, uh, the Great War, you see that the typical references to uh, the Risorgimento, to Garibaldi, etc., uh, are reconfigured and refunctionalized and are used to mean something different in opposition to the recent experiences of the war, for instance, and the Marcha, it's not just a reference to Garibaldi, so it's not just going back in the past, it's also a way of trying to imagine a different kind of war, maybe a new kind of war, as opposed to the static war of the trenches, uh, the four years uh, in the trenches, 19, well, literally the three years, 1950, 1918, and also to the post-war diplomacy of the Palazzo. Uh, so the marcha is not just about the past, it's also about the present and the future, maybe. Same for the bel gesto and the colpo di mano, the idea that uh, with uh, a group of uh, companions, friends, if you want, uh, you can uh, perform highly spectacular, maybe from a military point of view, not very efficient, but highly spectacular, and from a propaganda point of view, very efficient uh, actions. Think of the Volo su Vienna in 1918, the Befa di Bucari, etc. Again, this is opposed to anonymous mass war, the, the idea that with a limited group of volunteers, you can do something that actually um, um, moves away from this highly te uh, technological, uh, war uh, which the great war actually actually was um, another interesting thing is also that space and also time are reconfigured of course by technology uh, and that is actually present also in in uh, several of danuncio's discourses uh, and also in a couple of uh, literary texts some few may definitely they are present for instance uh, of course uh, airplanes uh, uh, they really change uh, the way, well, the way space is experienced, time is experienced, and also change the connection between Fiume and, uh, and Italy, for instance, or Fiume and the rest of the world, for that matter. Same thing for radio waves. Huh? Uh, Marconi visits Fiume in the fall of 1920, and there's an interesting comment, an interesting discourse by D'Annunzio uh, then, a uh, speech in which he actually uses the image of the, the, the radio waves as Fiume is like a beacon, of light, uh, uh, like in a message of hope to the world. Uh, and thanks to radio, actually, you, one could say that that is actually possible. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, other media, uh, it has been argued that Garibaldi and uh, Lucy Ryle's biography of Garibaldi, uh, Garibaldi as a phenomenon, is a product, if you want, has been made possible by uh, the print revolution, the media revolution of the 19th century, where actually, if you may, we see uh, the important role, um, the crucial role that new media uh, play, radio, but also photography. Huh? Uh, Fiumi, of course, there, there are tons of uh, photographs of, uh, of the Fiumi occupation, even film. Uh, mm. uh, and then the press has a mixed medium. Uh, there are lots of accounts on Fiumi uh, that are full of illustrations, uh, of course. Uh, so this is also um, important in the sense that the memoria of the Risorgimento is uh, reconfigured uh, in the 20th century context. Um, the third and final point is about community. Uh, Fiume is a lot, especially in 1920, the first months it's a bit different maybe, but you see in 1920 increasingly, uh, Fiume is seen as um, an entity in itself huh? and that the first um, connections to be made are within Fiume, the community of legionari, the community of volunteers, uh, uh, of fellow travelers, etc. And you see that the logic becomes a logic of the avant-garde, if you want, a military avant-garde, of course, a small army of volunteers, but also social political avant-garde, uh, uh, creating new institutions, creating a new uh, social, um, uh, social context and a cultural logic of the avant-garde. We should not forget that indeed uh, uh, there were futurists in Fiume, maybe not a lot of them, and maybe Marinetti uh, was actually forced to leave after, uh, I think, two weeks, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, but still, uh, futurists were indeed um, uh, part, of, part of the equation here. And you see also this focus on the community. It's actually, it has to be, a, that doesn't have to be a big community. Uh, actually, uh, it's a small scale community uh, of the, the chosen ones, if you want, the few chosen ones uh, performing individual spectacular, individual actions. So again, here you might say that there is uh, this tendency to move away from the paradigm of the nation state, definitely. And so from that point of view also, I mean, there has been a lot of talk also by, by, by many historians uh, uh, about the failure of Fiume. Eh? Fiume could be seen as, well, a failure in the sense that Tanunzio eventually in 1920, the end of 1920, the Natale di Sangue is, I mean, is forced out of Fiume. Yeah. And is forced to leave Fiume. Um, this has been blamed upon his lack of political talent or insight. He was a dilettante. He was incapable of uh, uh, coherent uh, policy, etc. I guess that is true, but that is not the point, I think. I think D'Annunzio did not want to be uh, an efficient uh, politician. He was not interested in the state. And that's all, also something that, of course, will oppose him to Mussolini. Huh? D'Annunzio is not interested in organizing a state apparatus. And so you can also see 1920 that actually um, the anarcho-individualist tendencies in Fiume uh, take to some extent the upper hand um, uh, with this idea of it's a small community uh, of individuals. And you can even see that in the memory of Fiume at the Vittoriale, and this will be our final point and final slide. Actually the memory, the way Fiume is, uh, um, is present in the Vittoriale is actually pretty much a memoria comunitaria. It's actually D'Annunzio and uh, his fellow legion, uh, legionaries, uh, and to a far less extent, a national memory, at least uh, with regard to Fiume. Um, and this is on the final slide, and you see, of course, the mausoleum uh, on top of the hill uh, above uh, the house of the Vittoriale. Uh, center stage is, of course, D'Annunzio's uh, tomb. But he's surrounded by tombs of veterans of Fiume. Uh, so it is actually a, re a recreation, if you want, of Fiume, uh, uh, the small community um, of the Uskoki, of the pirates, yeah. uh, performing their actions in, uh, in the garden of the Vittoriale. I think for us, yeah, that's all for the time being. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bart and Carlo, for this great presentation. I have a lot of questions, but I will uh, leave um, the floor to the audience first to see if there are any questions from them in Italian, English, or whichever spoken language. <laughs> Ernesto Livorni, please. It's 
I'll break the ice so that I get to say hello to Bart van der Boske, whom I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, and uh, I greet Carlo Leo, who is certainly in nice good hands. Uh, oh, in, that's uh, for in sure. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciated your uh, presentation very much. I'm also interested uh, in the topic, uh, obviously, but uh, I certainly appreciated the way you structured the talk on uh, uh, Fiume. I want to focus on the aspect that concerns the most this group, Ottocentismi. And so the relationship that you emphasized between D'Annunzio, the Fiume adventure, and the 19th century. When you were talking in the last slides, you were referring to, in fact, you know, the, 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 the third aspect, if I remember correctly, the, the third uh, uh, phase of your uh, uh, presentation, focusing on uh, Ottocento, uh, I couldn't help thinking that you were referring to a number of uh, futurist uh, items. And I was not surprised to hear Bart talking about avant-garde and uh, also referring to the presence of futurist Marinetti uh, himself in uh, Fiume. Uh, to be more specific, uh, uh, projecting different ideas of the future, breaking away from space time of the nation state, which reminded me, especially considering the sort of timeline, <laughs> Uh, Eta Comunale, Venice, uh, of course, Rome, even before then, uh, all the way to the Risorgimento, it, it seemed to emphasize the concept of simultaneity, you know? as if the Nuncio were borrowing simultaneity uh, as a way of uh, breaking away from a, from a conventional understanding of space time applied to the nation state. And uh, even more so, uh, when you were talking about the horizontal and the vertical configurations of space and time, for the horizontal, you refer to media, radio, photography, film, press. Uh, and of course, uh, I could not help but think of the imaginazione senza fili. <laughs> um, and uh, same thing with uh, the vertical uh, configuration, you refer to radio waves, to the airplane. So um, I, I was struck by this, uh, almost impossibility of separating uh, D'Annunzio's desire to link the Fiume adventure to several uh, phases in history, to World War I, and certainly to the Risorgimento, uh, and at the same time borrowing um, a new ap uh, appreciation of time and space through futurism, even though we know that no matter how much uh, Marinetti appreciated D'Annunzio, uh, wrote on D'Annunzio, uh, and, and we know what, no, and um, D'Annunzio uh, officially never uh, praised Marinetti that much. However, considering your presentation, it seems that D'Annunzio is revisiting the past according to tenets that the futurists were still elaborating because after all, 1909 was not so far away from 1919. Um, this is not a, a specific question I'm asking you, uh, but more an invitation to reflect on uh, uh, this, this uh, convergence of the Annunzio's interest in uh, linking uh, as a sort of crucial event, the Fiume adventure to Risorgimento and World War I. We know what Mussolini will do with World War I, right? And with Risorgimento uh, itself, fascism yeah. will be the climactic moment of uh, uh, Risorgimento. Um, and at the same time, you know, the presence of the future, the presence of the understanding of uh, uh, a new way of dealing with uh, space and time, you know, uh, 
scientific um, discoveries uh, are helping in, uh, in this respect, regardless of D'Annunzio's and Marinetti's knowledge of uh, Einstein, Planck, <laughs> no, let alone Marconi, uh, to whom you uh, refer. So um, forgive me for this um, chaotic invitation uh, to uh, <laughs> go deeper in uh, uh, that third section of your uh, uh, presentation, but uh, uh, I hope it's uh, stimulating enough, titillating enough for you to intervene and help me to figure out things. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, as uh, very much a work in progress, this one. So we really appreciate the feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. For real, I mean, really, we appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And so it's paradoxical in a way that our you know, uh, intention was to break away from you know, this reading of uh, D'Annunzio and Fiume as being you know, uh, 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 characterized by this uh, futurist uh, environment, but in the end, there's still some truth to it. But uh, of course, I think that simultaneity is, is, a, is a good way to put it, also as a political strategy referring to D'Annunzio. In a way that, uh, what I mean is that D'Annunzio tries to be accommodating to integrate the various aspects of the occupation, indeed the futurist aspects, uh, and also the, the more traditional, the more conservative uh, aspects. And indeed, I, I, I wouldn't solely focus on uh, interest in new kinds of military um, advancement, let's say, you know, the artitism or the, the, the plane or the as specific futurist topics. If we refer maybe previously to the Nuncia's uh, early works, such as uh, um, for example, but yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot that he talks about airplanes. Mm -hmm. Like, um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, it's interesting. And, and yeah, I don't know if it's specifically futurist. Well, it is to some extent. I mean, I think also the, the presence of Mario Carli in Fiume is important uh, yeah. for connection between D'Annunzio and the Futurists. Of, of course, D'Annunzio would not consider himself a futurist, but uh, there are definitely in, in Fiume 1920, uh, the, the situation is a bit fluid if you want. Uh, and then you see, in fact, that uh, to, I mean, D'Annunzio also in other speeches moves. Uh, he, I mean, he has to keep the, the whole damn thing together also. Eh? And so, of course, you see some, some flexibility there uh, to use a positive term. Um, but the interesting thing definitely is that um, in, when it comes to combining, uh, sampling different historical references, sometimes also in contradictory ways. I mean, you can yeah, invoke yeah. the Roman Empire yeah. and then you can talk about eta communale and the importance of regional identities and autonomy, of course. That does not add up, but it, it's. I think it's the way also for D'Annunzio to some extent to opening up new possibilities of imagining something that is not yet there. And that with the, the, the Carta del Carnaro, the constitution for Fiume, you see some, some traces there of inventing something new. So it's also a way of creating possibilities, maybe not to go as far as the futurists with their totally breaking away, doing away with space and time altogether, but trying to reconfigure space and time and to come up with something new to free yourself from the burdens of the past or use the past against the past or against the way of, of, of blocking everything by referring to the past. But that is then the connection to, to Nietzsche's text on, on history, of course. Anyway, thank you very much for the interesting comments. Uh, really, I mean, we really appreciate it. Any other question from the audience? Gabriella. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me lower my hand first. Um, thank you very much for this very interesting um, presentation. I have, um, yeah, a kind of a question on um, how, uh, which I found very interesting um, about how you initially talked of Fiume as a microcosm of modernity and for the challenges and the idea that pretend is, and I would say for the paradoxes. Um, you presented as um, 
uh, within a national discourse and yet outside of it or trying to get away. But the way that you, pre the, the way that you um, elaborate on how this was really an imagined community really falls into you know, the obvious uh, Anderson, Benedict Anderson um, analysis of nationalist discourse of the 19th century and how these communities are, first of all, imagined. Um, but I was wondering, but at the same time, I see this as the paradox and the shortcomings of those national discourse. For example, when it came to consider to the, um, the groups within that national discourse. So I was wondering, Fiume was obviously for the majority Italian, but it was not just Italian. There were other communities, the Hungarian, uh, Croatians, and so forth. Um, how was this multiple presence envisioned within the denuncius, uh, you know, take of, of Fiume? And how does that, you know, because you haven't heard anything, and how that represents, in fact, one of the, not only the shortcomings, but one of the weaknesses of that project? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, Thank a you. very important one. Uh, also one that, well, it has not been entirely overlooked by, by scholars, but to some extent it has. Uh, um, indeed, that is a big question. Um, there are many, I think there are many ways to, well, not to answer the question, but to begin formulating an answer. Uh, um, I think Danuncio himself, I mean, you can accuse Danuncio of many bad things, but um, from that point of view, he, uh, his idea about, uh, was basically, basically one that, okay, there is the, the primato della cultura latina. Uh, and so, uh, of course, Fiume uh, could um, um, have different communities, uh, but definitely the, the, the point of reference should be the cultura latina, right? kind of uh, superiority of, of the, uh, the Latin, uh, to use a broad term then, the Latin uh, culture. Um, but of course, there are also episodes of, of intolerance where there is really the case of, okay, we should, we should kick all the others out because they're just uh, there to, uh, to allow the Serbs to try to conquer Fiume and to impose their idea of Yugoslavia, etc. So it's 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 an interesting thing, and it is it has been. And you you can also see in, in in many of the texts, not just by Danuncio, also by others, it's just not taken into account. It's put a bit to the side. It's a bit uneasy. Um, it's also maybe seen to some extent as an argument for the autonomisti. Uh, uh, so it's a bit it, it's, it's complex. I don't know, Carlo, if you have uh, I, things to add. Or... Actually, I agree. Uh, there is this. I mean, we have instances of intolerance. Uh, there are, uh, I mean, going through the archives, we can see that there are, uh, there is legislation against uh, Croatian insurgents in Fiume, so they are taken away indeed. They are put, a, put on, uh, at a side, indeed, as Bart would say. And, but there's also, that's interesting, this orientalizing, romanticized view of the Croatian to be seduced and in, uh, in, in the literature uh, about Fiume, the Croatian component is often female. So Marinetti in his Poema di Fiume would you know, uh, conquer the Croatian women and let's say, I mean, biblically uh, be with them. Uh, in other writers, we have uh, you know, this idea of patronizing and, and, and of course, uh, yeah, um, a patronizing idea of taking care of the female components, the creation parts that can be ideally converted to the tipo Latino culturally. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a matter of blood. It's not really a matter of um, soil, well, soil in a way, yes, but not a matter of blood and, and descent. It's more a matter of cultural superiority mm -hmm. and the idea of you know yeah. being able to bring them over. Yeah, but uh, for instance, in the Carta del Carnaro, there is really the, this idea, the recognition also that Fiume has different communities and that in uh, education, different languages can be used. Huh? So the, it's very mixed and, and, and you can tell that 
the argument is a bit left out of the broader picture because it can create uneasy connections or it can maybe uh, harm the position uh, of the, the occupiers, etc. Uh, but it is, it is to some extent always there in a way. Can you look into Otto Weininger and his uh, Otto Weininger, he wrote sex um, so that it was extremely popular philosophical treatise. I think it came out in 1909 or something like that, um, that defined the feminine, uh, not necessarily with the female sex, but as the, you know, the weak link of the human existence that could also sometimes be found in men. And particularly, he writes in Jewish men, but um, it's uh, it it's it was extremely popular within fascist ideology as well in the in the twenties and the thirties. So I don't know if that can be of any. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Martina. Sorry, there is a question by Stefano Bragato. Yes, thank you, Martina. Um, well, I very much enjoyed your talk. And uh, um, also because, you know, working on D'Annunzio and Marinetti, I, I, re I very, very much like the way you, you framed all this, uh, um, well, idea of Fiume and of the ways in which D'Annunzio uh, takes all the legacy of the Risorgimento. And my question would be about um, the legacy of Fiume during fascism, um, which I think is quite uh, intriguing in a way, no? Because fascism, you know, fascism, Mussolini, of course, um, he appropriates Fiume and all the idea of Fiume. But on another side, I'm thinking about Marinetti, for instance, but also about, I mean, other intellectuals, Fiume becomes a, maybe, I don't know, I'm asking you, Fiume becomes the idea of a, the memory, the legacy of a uh, fascismo delle origini, in a way. I'm thinking of, you, you showed a, a minute of uh, Il Cattivo Poeta, and I'm, I, I was thinking about the end of Il Cattivo Poeta, when a group of, a small group of legionari come to the Vittoriale, and D'Annunzio salutes them, he needs a slipper, he's old, and he remembers this glorious time of Fiume, no? And um, I'm also thinking about the, you, you, Carlo, you mentioned the Poema di Fiume by Marinetti, and I think that there, um, also um, in the um, Poema dei, dei Diciannovisti, del Diciannovismo by Marinetti, I don't know, maybe there is this idea of taking Fiume as a, again, um, fascismo delle origini, a sort of, you know, fascismo, uh, diciannovismo, which is um, contraposed, which is just a post, which is uh, um, different from, you know, the, uh, the ways in, in, in which, I mean, yes, yeah, so the, the direction that fascism took afterwards. So, I don't know what you think about this. Um, and you also spoke about this idea of the, um, that Fiume is not a national um, memory, but is a, um, it's a memory of a community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this idea of maybe a community of fascisti della prima ora, uh, which in a way takes Fiume as, a, as an idea. I don't know if, if, I, if I made myself clear, but yeah. that's my yeah, question. Yeah, of course. So I think it's really interesting. I mean, I, I will not bore you with Carli all the time because it's, I mean, uh, yeah. So Mario Carli uh, was a futurist. And I think it's really interesting in this case because what you, what you say really feeds into the idea that Carli wants to put uh, forward uh, with uh, Mussolini. So he wants to say, uh, so you have to see us, you know, fascisti della prima ora, legionari, futuristi, because, I mean, in a certain way, it appears that, you know, everybody who was in Fiume later became a futurist. Of course, of course, it's not true, but it's the memory that gets, the legacy that gets perpetrated. But in a way, yeah, I agree. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's true. Um, you know, there, there was uh, the idea, the intention of a certain part of the fascisti della prima ora 
to represent themselves as the real uh, spirits of fascism, also opposing the vision of Gentile at the time. So uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree with you. Uh, yeah, yeah. What do you think, Bart? Yeah, yeah but I totally agree. And, and it's also, and then there are some uh, speeches by Mussolini in, in which he distances himself from, well, he already distanced himself yeah, from yeah, Fiume yeah. while the occupation was going on, we know. But afterwards also say, you know, it was immature, it was a bunch of, of youngsters who did not really knew what they were doing. And then this poet, well, he didn't have a clue. He didn't know how to run uh, run his business. I know, but he didn't, he didn't have a clue, etc. So you see there also in, um, in another direction then that Mussolini says indirectly the same, like this is really a kind of, well, fascismo della prima ora, but for him, like in the, in the negative sense of improvising stuff. Uh, and that's a speech, I think from 27, 28, something yeah. like that. I don't, I don't recall exactly. But distancing himself from this, this kind of dicianovismo that was really a bit of chaos and a confusion, etc. Um, I have a question about women. Uh, Carla, you mentioned your Mary Vitalia. I know there's a lot that you're working a lot on women uh, at Fiume. So I wanted to ask if there is also alongside the canon of he heroes, a canon of heroines for, for these women, maybe coming from history or from the Risorgimento, I think at some point you mentioned Anita Garibaldi to me while talking about your project. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Yeah. Uh, it's it's very present the memory of uh, Anita Garibaldi. Yeah, this double, um, which doubles as a you know, memory of a heroine, of course, uh, but also a mother. So that's the idea also with fascism that uh, uh, women should be mothers, but also in a certain way, warriors. But again, warriors only when defending the, the the family, their, their, house, their home, of course. Yeah, so uh, Anita Garibaldi is, of course, one of the uh, point of reference, the persons of reference. But I would also say that um, maybe there were you know, also interesting persons of reference that were becoming pretty famous. I will say divas in Fiume. One of these is the cousin of the famous uh, Guido Keller. Um, so she Besozzi, she, she, uh, she calls herself, uh, herself fiam, fiam, uh, Fiammetta. Uh, in Fiume, she has a, a, a couple of articles that she uh, sent out when she was in Fiume. She portrays herself as a real independent uh, woman. Um, and it's interesting because it, it portrays another idea um, of women in Fiume. And that's the idea that gets perpetrated every time. The idea of free women, futurist women, uh, they are free to sleep with whomever, they're free to do whatever, they have the right to vote, even if, uh, even before the Annuncio in Fiume, thanks to the Austro-Hungarian uh, authority, they had the right to vote. So it's not a, a novelty. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Danunzio takes credit there for something actually the Austrians uh, conceded to uh, uh, Fiume as a corpus separatum to have a specific legal status. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> if yeah, I remember, the... please. Please, please, Martina. No, it's just, just a thought. I, if I yeah. remember correctly, the, the, uh, the um, Austrian rule was also particularly, uh, well, considering the context, relatively liberal towards Jews, am I right? So that the Jews of the Austrian in, in, Empire yeah. was... Yeah, historically or under the historically or under the no, 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 historically, before. just before. Yeah, 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 indeed, yes, yes. Jews under the Nuncio. Mm, <laughs> new, new project. There are, there, there are legendaries uh, that are uh, of Jewish you know, persuasion, I would say. Yeah, there are some. And later they, they experienced some troubles when they were trying to be recognized during fascism as, you know, as fascist, because, you know, if you were a, a legionnaire, you could, you know, have a, a pension, a special fund. And so there was a conflict because they were Jewish, 
but they were trying to say that they were fascisti della prima ora because they were legionnaires. So there, there's an interesting conflict, you know, uh, but I will leave this to maybe historians. I don't, you know, they, they have to get through the archives there. Anyway, yeah. Is there any further questions from the audience? I was just, I mean, I was just gonna mention something very quickly about uh, um, these of these papers. Of course, when I mean, you talk about mediation, right? I mean, and how that, of course, played a, a major role. I mean, uh, also as characterizing, right? I mean, this moment as uh, not just, I mean, the human experience as an, um, an experience, an example of modernity, but at the same time, of course, I mean, newspapers very much characterize, right? I mean, the, um, the society and culture of the 19th century. And uh, um, I was just, you know, interested about the role that uh, newspapers play in your research. I mean, you uh, quote several of them, right? I mean, your presentation and obviously they were important, but and in particular, I was thinking, and maybe we can also, I mean, <laughs> talk, I mean, uh, in a, um, I can send you an email about this. I mean, I'm actually working now, I mean, on the last two decades of the 19th century, and I came across, you know, the word uh, irredentism, and a lot also used, for instance, in some radical papers to, or journals, uh, La Commedia Humana, I'm thinking of like that, um, to criticize um, uh, colonialism, right? I mean, what was going on in Eritrea, and just, I mean, sort of, you know, uh, in a uh, uh, also the ironic, but also very <laughs> harsh way, harsh tone, I mean, the journalists write, well, I mean, there is a, a mistake here. I mean, uh, they're thinking about uh, terra irredente as Eritrea, I mean, <laughs> instead of uh, as of, uh, the, the land, the patria of uh, Tomaseo, right? I mean, so, and I as I was just, you know, uh, wondering if, you know, the term uh, irredentism, I mean, during your research, I mean, uh, came up maybe in different, uh, in papers, of different orientations, I mean, in uh, yeah. the communism, yeah. Not that I can remember, but this is really a very interesting thing. And of course, that ties in with and what is indeed present in Fiume, yeah. this, this beginning of an, an anti-colonial discourse. Uh, but I, I don't think, for instance, Egypt and Ireland are called terri redente. It's more like oppressed people. Oppressed people, yeah, yeah I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Victims of uh, the big empires and the plutocracies. Yeah, but the identismo is actually used only, I think, I could check, eh, but only for, for actually uh, Italy. Italy. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll have to check. But that's an interesting, anyway, interesting because, um, I mean, it's really exciting, actually. Uh, yeah. There's a new ha avenue of research that one can do. Yeah. The connection again between like 19th century and 20th century, I mean, along uh, these lines of. Uh, yeah, indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morena. And are there any further questions? If not, uh, Bart Carlo, would you authorize me to uh, put the link to the project, the MIDRN page? Uh, in the chat so that everyone can have it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here in the chat, you have the link to the project, which I forgot to share before. Um, and perhaps I think we are a little bit late uh, in comparison to our usual schedule. So uh, let me thank very, very much Bart and Carlo for their brilliant presentation, everyone who came thanks to you, thanks to you. Uh, for being here today in this last and a bit a bit tired <laughs> uh, time of the academic year. This was the last um, event of the Ottocentismi lecture series and I, and I can't think of a better way of concluding our series. Thank you Bart and Carlo very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. I know the uh, applause are not done online. <laughs>